Good morning, guys. How are we doing today? Doing good. Okay, awesome. Welcome to Campus Worship. It's one of our last ones of the year, which is pretty sad. We're dwindling down, but I'm so glad you're all here joining us this morning. If I have not had the privilege to meet you yet, my name is Caitlin, and I serve as the assistant campus minister here, and I would love the opportunity to get to meet and know you. But this morning, we are so excited. We have Dr. Maurice Watson here with us from Metropolitan Baptist Church. And he has done so many incredible things. He's authored a book. He's been pastoring people. But above all else, he loves getting to teach the word of God and allowing God to just speak through him. So we're so pumped to have him here with us this morning and getting to allow him to do just that. So I'm going to go ahead and open us up in prayer, and then we will continue on in worship. Dear God, we love you so, so much. And God, we are so thankful that your presence is here, that you are filling this room this morning. And God, we just don't want to miss you. Lord, we know you're here. We know you want to speak to us. God, so often we come in with so many distractions. We're thinking about other things, our tests, our studies, relationships that are just feeling hard right now, God. So I just ask, God, for everyone in this room, would you allow us to just put everything else to the side and just allow us to fix our eyes, fix our hearts fully on you. God, we want to hear what you have to say to us today. God, soften our hearts, open our ears. We want to hear from you. We love you in your name. Amen. Amen.
approach the end of the semester here, things, things can start feeling a little heavy, if you're anything like me at least. And I just want to encourage you as we, as we sing to God and as we cast our worries on Him this morning, just I want to remind you that that's not a shot in the dark. We're casting everything in the hands of a God who reigns as King over the heavens and the earth and over all creation. So when we ask Him to help, we should expect something to happen because He cares for us and He's that powerful. So just as we sing this morning, lean into that. The God of the universe who created you, he loves you this morning and he cares for you.
Jesus, we pray that you would open our hearts, that we would receive your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we are thankful and we are grateful for the privilege that is ours of once again assembling ourselves together to worship you in a collective and corporate way. We confess our many sins before you. We pray you'd forgive us and cleanse us even now from all unrighteousness. Now I pray as I share your word today for a fresh anointing, a fresh enablement, a fresh empowerment of your Holy Spirit. Use me today in such a way that everything that I do and everything that I will say will only be done and only be said so that you might receive the glory. Cancel out every plan and scheme of the enemy. And we say, have your way, Lord, in us, through us and among us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this indeed is the day the Lord has made, and we ought to rejoice and be glad in it. And may I ask you a question this morning, how many of you are glad to be here today? Amen. I certainly want to thank you, uh, uh, Dean Didway, thank you so much for the invitation uh, to come today. It is a joy to come back to the campus of Anderson University. I want you to know that I share something with you this morning. I am a student of Anderson University. Uh, just as you, I have papers to write, I have stuff to turn in, and uh, I am working on a PhD in leadership here at Anderson, and the head of uh, that PhD department is here today, Dr. Small. It is my hope and prayer that my being here today will uh, uh, cause him to show a little grace and mercy um, and help me with my grades. <laughs> I want to share with you a familiar passage today, a story that maybe all of us knew from um, Sunday school or youth camp. Uh, it is a familiar story found in the, uh, the um, 15th chapter of Luke, Luke chapter 15, and I want to read this little story into your hearing. I'll begin at verse 11, and I'm reading f uh, through probably the end of the chapter. I know that's a lot of reading, but we need to read the Bible more, don't we? Would you just indulge me today and stand with me as I read the word of God into our hearing. Now, there's nothing necessarily spiritual about standing when the Bible is read. If nothing more, it gets the blood running warmer in your veins so that whatever happens this morning when I go back to Washington, D.C., I'll be able to tell everybody I stood them up. I had them on their feet. All right, Luke chapter 15, beginning at verse 11. Here's how my Bible reads from the New King James Bible. He said, a certain man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his, li his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine, and he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate and no one gave him anything but when he came to himself he said how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare and I perish with hunger I will arise and go to my father and will say to him father I have sinned against heaven and before you and am no longer worthy to be called your son make me like one of your hired servants so he arose and came to his father but when he was still a Great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was Lost and is found, and they began to be merry. Now his oldest son was in the field, and 
As he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked what, what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed a fatted calf. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I've been serving you. I've never transgressed your commandment at any time, yet you never gave me a young goat that I may make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured his livelihood with heartlets, you killed a fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again, and was lost and is found. From this familiar passage, you may be seated, I want to talk simply about the story of three prodigals. Carolyn Johnson is a 47-year-old mother of three children. She's been saved for 15 years. She and her children go to church every Sunday. They attend Sunday school and they are present at Bible study every Wednesday night. Carolyn is also very disciplined with her devotional life. She wakes up early every morning and reads the Bible, and she spends quality time on her knees in prayer. But Carolyn is unhappy in her marriage. She's frustrated because Carl, her husband, is not a very spiritual man. As a matter of fact, in the, in the 10 years that they've been married, she's attended church with, he's attended church with his family only a few times, maybe at Christmas or Easter, when the children have to appear on holiday programs. Carl claims to be a Christian, but he just doesn't see the need to attend church. This frustrates Carolyn because she feels that Carl is not being the spiritual leader of his family that he ought to be. As a matter of fact, uh, Carolyn even told Carl that she was going to file for divorce if he didn't start going to church, because as a strong Christian woman, she felt that she needed a stronger Christian man in her life. Jalisa McBride is a 14-year-old teenager who just had a baby. Second Baptist Church, where she attends, has been enlisting young people to sing in the newly formed youth choir. She showed up for choir rehearsal, but the youth worker pulled her to the side and told her that she was not going to be permitted to sing in the choir. She asked why she couldn't sing, and she was told, well, you can't sing for two reasons. First, because the church has a long-standing tradition that says that the woman had a baby out of wedlock. She had to first stop and appear before the church and apologize for her sins before she'd be allowed to participate in church activity. And the second reason she was told that she was not being able, allowed to sing with the children is because some of the parents of the other children were uncomfortable with her being allowed to sing. They felt that she might be a bad influence on their children because she had a baby at such a young age. This hurt little Jalisa so badly until she left the church. While these two stories that I just told you are fictional, I made them up. <laughs> The unfortunate reality is that instances similar to them happen too often in real life. So let me tell you a quick story that actually happened. This is a quick story, and I, I won't reveal the identities of the persons involved to protect both the innocent and the guilty. When I pastored in Omaha, Nebraska, a couple in my church decided to enroll their little daughter in in an elementary school that was out in the suburbs. The application process was going smoothly until the school administrators discovered that their daughter, this girl, the parent's daughter, was African American. The school, this school was sponsored by an ultra-conservative white evangelical church out in the suburbs. I received the phone call one day from the pastor of that church. He told me, that the girl's parents had indicated that they were members of my church and he wanted to know if I knew them. I told him, yes, I know the little girl and I know her parents. And he proceeded to tell me that he didn't think that that girl would be happy if she attended their school. I asked him why he felt that way. He said because she would be the only African-American student in the school. 
He went on to tell me that there were other, other uh, private schools in the inner city where most of the black people lived that she would better fit in. Now, while it was obvious that the pastor, along with his congregation and school officials, had some kind of a racial issue, what he went on to say to me or ask me revealed an even more sinister problem that he had. He asked me, true story, he said, oh, by the way, which version of the Bible does your church use? Do you all use the King James Version? And do your people believe in speaking in tongues? This pastor's line of questioning not only revealed that he had some racial issues, but it also revealed that his ultra-conservative, evangelical, um, King James-only false version or notion of Christianity was mostly concerned about keeping people that were different than he and his congregation out of their church and out of their school. Of course, I advised the parents of that little girl not to enroll their child in that school, not because she would be the only African-American, but I told them not to do it because the pastor had made it clear that she wouldn't be welcomed and she wouldn't be loved. Each of these little stories that I just told you, the first two were fictional and the last one actually happened. Each of them, I believe, highlights the ugly reality of self-righteousness. Carolyn Johnson was a self-righteous wife because she threatened to divorce her husband because he was not a stronger Christian than her. And the youth worker and the members of Second Baptist Church expressed their self-righteousness when they insisted on publicly humiliating Jaleesa McBride by making her apologize before the church when they refused to allow her to sing in the choir because she had a baby out of wedlock. And the pastor in Nebraska revealed that he not only had some kind of racial animus, but he was also self-righteous because he and his congregation refused to welcome a young black girl in their school because they were more concerned about protecting the orthodoxy of their doctrinal beliefs. You see, they believed that the church that that girl and her parents attended was not conservative enough for her to be welcomed in that school. You know, friends, one of the ugly and unfortunate realities that I believe hurts the witness of the church today is the spirit of self-righteousness. It is the false notion of spiritual superiority. People who are self-righteous despise or view with contempt those who do not measure up to their standards. And to be sure, any one of us can be guilty of having a self-righteous attitude if we're not mindful. Friends, it was the self-righteous people of Jesus' day, the scribes and Pharisees, the religious leaders who were opposed to his ministry. One day, as Jesus was sitting at a table with a group of people that the Pharisees and religious leaders considered to be sinners, you know, immoral people, adulterers, dishonest people, tax collectors, gamblers, and those who were disinterested and indifferent to the organized religion of the day. Verse 2, when you get a chance, read verse 2 of chapter 15 because that's the key to understanding the whole chapter. Verse 2 tells us that the scribes and Pharisees complained and murmured against Jesus because he was eating at the same table with such an ignominious group of people. They, they questioned the veracity of Jesus' ministry because as they saw it, no true teacher, no true rabbi would hold table fellowship with sinners and the scum of the earth. And Jesus told this little parable that I read into your hearing in response to their, to his, uh, their questioning why he was sharing a meal with sinners. Jesus said, you, you want to know why I eat with sinners? You want to know why I take time out to sit at the same table and fellowship with sinners? Let me tell you a story. A certain man had two sons. And the younger boy asked his father to give him the portion of the family's inheritance or land that belonged to him. Now, according to the law, he was entitled to one-third of the family's land or inheritance, while his older brother was entitled to two-thirds. But inheritances were only usually acted upon upon the death of his father. But this young man's request, according to Gary Ingrid, was a dagger in his father's heart. He doesn't want a loan 
He wants his inheritance. It's as if he was saying to his father, if you won't hurry up and die, I want mine right now. I won't wait for it. I want it right now. This boy wanted freedom from the rules and regulations of his father's home. He wanted what a lot of young people want today, and that is freedom without restraints. The father didn't argue with him, gave him his request. The boy took his possessions, took his title deed, if you will, and he converted it, he liquidated it, turned it into cash, sold it, and gathered all of his belongings and, and, and went out in, into what Jesus calls the far country. Now, the far country was Gentile territory, non-Jewish territory, where he would uh, be ruled and governed by the mores, if you will, uh, of a pagan society. This boy had no intention of ever coming back. But the Bible says, Jesus said, he wasted his, all of his money, all of his substances with wasteful and sinful living. And guess what? When all of his money was gone, guess where all of his so-called friends went? They left as well. Look at this boy in your mind's eye, in your imagination. All of his money is gone. His friends have deserted him and doubling his misery is that at that very moment, Jesus says, a severe famine uh, hit the land. He found himself, friends, with no friends, no finances, and no food. He's at the corner of that, of that famous intersection of Hard Luck Boulevard and Needmore Street. But then Jesus said the boy did the worst thing that any Jewish male or male could do. He went to work for a Gentile hog farmer. Now, the law strictly forbade a Jew to work for a non-Jew, and it absolutely forbade a Jew to have contact with swine because swine or pigs were considered unclean. And when the boy was messing around with pigs, it was almost tantamount to him being excommunicated from Sabbath worship. It was as if he had renounced his own religion. The boy became so hungry and so desperate, the Lord says, until he was tempted to eat the almost unedible food that the hogs were eating. He was dirty, raggedy, tattered, shameful, and in disgrace. He's at the lowest point in his life, but Jesus said that boy came to himself, came to his senses, and he reasoned to himself, my father has day laborers, has day laborers who are living better than I. They've got plenty of food, and here I am about to starve to death. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to get up from here and go back to my father and I'm going to confess to him that I've sinned against heaven and before you and, and I'm, I know I'm no longer worthy or entitled to sonship, but father, if you would just treat me like one of your day laborers, like one of your hired servants, that'll be all I need. His father, brothers and sisters, who never gave up on his son, I believe it was sitting there waiting with anticipation, hoping for the day that his son would return. And one day, perhaps while sitting on the porch, he looked down the road and in the distance, he could see or make out the silhouette of a familiar sight. The closer that, si that person got to him, he noticed the gate, the familiar gate with which he walked. And he said, wait, that's my son, that's my son. And that old man did something that no self-respecting older Jewish man would do. He ran in public. Now you have to understand that running in public for a Jewish older man was considered undignified, that he violated the protocol of the village. He's not supposed to be running, but he said, I don't care about the protocol, that's my son. And he fell on his neck and began to kiss him repeatedly over and over. Now, slaves, would bend over to kiss their master's hand or maybe their master's feet, but to kiss someone in the face suggests that you considered them to be your equal. And without a word being spoken, the father says to his son, son, no matter what you've done, you're still my son and I love you. The father then looked at his son's appearance and noticed that his son was tattered and raggedy. And he said to one of his servants, hey, servant, you go get the best robe, literally, go get my robe and put on my board. For a host to give his personal robe to a guest means that he treated that person as the guest of honor. Go get my robe and put on him. He looked at his son and noticed he was ringless. He said, hey, you servant, go get a ring and put on my son. Now, it was a signet ring, a ring of authority. My son has authority. He looked down at his son, his son's bare feet. He said, wait a minute. Now, slaves 
uh, went around bare feet, but only free men at the time wore shoes. And the man said, my son is not a slave. My son is a free man. Go get some sandals and put on my son's feet. And you go kill the fatted calf because we are going to have a party. Just then, the older son came in from the field. And he noticed all of this, heard all this music and dancing. He could see grown men whirling and dancing and celebrating. And said one of the servants, what's going on? He says, you don't know? Your brother has literally come back from the dead. We thought he was dead, but he's still alive. And your father has thrown a party for him. But the older son became angry and refused to go inside. The father, who saw his older son outside, sulking in anger, he could have easily sent someone out to him and said, go get him and tell him to come in here. But instead, he treated the older boy in the same way that he had treated his younger son. He didn't wait till the boy came to him. He ran out to him and said, son, come on in the house and enjoy the party because your brother was lost and now is found. Your brother is alive. And the son protested and said, all these years I've been serving you, literally, I've been slaving for you. I never disobeyed your commandments, but you never gave me a party. But when this your son, notice he doesn't even call him my brother or, or call his brother by name. When your son came home, you threw a party for him and that's not right. And that's when the, the old man said to his son, son, you're missing the bigger point. It was only right that we celebrate because your brother was dead and is alive. Your brother was lost and is found. Now, that's the story. And Jesus leaves that story open-ended. He does not tell us whether or not the older boy went inside and joined the celebration or whether he stayed outside sulking in anger and self-pity. When you look at this parable, I think it's obvious that the father in the parable represents God. And I would make the case that the younger boy who had gone to the far country, but who had now returned home, represented those sinners that were sitting at the table with Jesus. And the older boy who was sulking in self-pity and, and anger represented those scribes and Pharisees in verse 2, who were wondering, why is Jesus eating with sinners? And Jesus told this parable in response to their question. You want to know why I eat with sinners? You want to know why I, I, I fellowship with sinners? Because I love sinners. I throw a party for sinners. Now, are you going to remain outside in your anger and bitterness and self-righteousness? Or are you going to come inside and enjoy the party. While this parable has been traditionally been known as the parable of the lost son or the parable of the prodigal son, I believe it could be called the parable of a father and his two prodigal sons. There are two prodigal sons in this parable. There are two prodigals. One prodigal is in the far country and the other prodigal is at home. One prodigal who commits, listen to this, open, obvious, public sins and another prodigal who commits sins of the heart. One prodigal who's caught up in the world and the other prodigal who goes to church every Sunday, but both of them are lost. One boy left home and went into the far country, but the other boy, while still at home, was just as far from his father's heart. Jesus shows pity when you read your Bible on people who commit open, obvious public sins. Remember the woman caught in adultery? He said to her, I forgive you, now go and sin no more. But people who committed sins of the heart, like the Pharisees, he called them hypocrites. He said, on the outside you appear like whitewashed tombs, but on the inside you're full of dead men's bones. Now, Lord Ogilvie has suggested that the elder bro brother is a look in the mirror for most of us. While there's a little of both of these boys in all of us, most of us, I believe, we identify with the sins of the elder brother. What were his sins? I'm glad you asked it. I'm in my seat. First of all, he was self-righteous. 
verse 29, he said, these many years I've been serving you, literally, I've been slaving for you. I never transferred your commandments. I did everything you told me to do. In other words, I never left home. I stayed and worked and did everything you asked me to do, and yet you never gave me a party. You see, he thought that he had been good enough to earn his father's love and to earn his father's favor. He didn't understand the true meaning of sonship. That sonship is not something that you earn, but sonship is about having a proper fellowship with the father. He thought that because he stayed home, that it made him deserving of his father's love, while conversely, because his younger brother left home, it made him undeserving of his father's love and favor. It was his way of implying that he was spiritually superior to his younger brother. This, friends, is self-righteousness at its peak. This older boy didn't understand that the far country is not measured in geographical measurement, but the far country is measured by the spiritual disposition of one's heart toward the Father. You see, this boy had a darkened heart, and St. Augustine said that a darkened heart is the far country. No, you don't drink. No, you don't smoke dope. No, you don't ch chase skirts nor pants. But ask yourself, are there moments when I'm self-righteous? Are there moments when I look at the sins of others as being worse than mine? We have a tendency to measure our spiritual maturity by Comparing ourselves to others, when you back up to people and you see how tall you are spiritually and how short they are spiritually, but you can always find someone who's less spiritual than you. But if you really want to know how spiritual you really are, don't back up to your brother or your sister, back up to Jesus. And you'll see how infinitely tall, taller he is than all of us. What Jesus is trying to teach us is that sins of the heart are just as wrong as open, obvious, public sins. He was self-righteous, but wait, he was jealous. He said to his father, you never gave me a young goat, you never threw a party for me. You see, he failed to see how good his father had daily been in his own life because he kept looking at what his father was doing for his younger brother. And how many people come to church every Sunday but they are not able to worship God with a pure heart because they can't get their eyes off of what God is doing for someone else. No, you don't drink. No, you don't smoke dope. No, you don't chase skirts nor pants. But when others receive a blessing or a promotion, how does it affect you? When a neighbor gets a blessing that maybe you coveted, that you wanted, it didn't go to you, it went to them. Do you look at other people's success as your failure and other people's failure as your success? And if you do, it's a spirit of jealousy and Jesus is reminding us that sins of the heart are just as wrong as open obvious public sins but wait there's something else when we look at the sins of the older brother not only was he self-righteous and jealous he was also judgmental Look at verse 30. It says, but as soon as this son of yours came who devoured your livelihood, watch what he said, with harlots, prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Now notice the older boy now adds assumed activities to the list of his younger brother's sins that were not before mentioned. Jesus hadn't said anything about harlots and prostitutes. But judgmental people are quick to point out not only the sins, but the assumed sins of others, but they fail to see the sin that is in their own lives. Jesus said, remember in Matthew 7, judge not that you be not judged. 
And why do you look at the speck that's in your brother's eye? But do not consider the plank that is in your own eye. Remember, whenever you point the finger of accusation at someone else, three fingers are pointing back at you. I suspect that this self-righteous, judgmental older brother was jealous of the sins of his younger brother. It's as if he was saying, you know what? He got to have all the fun, going to parties, getting drunk, sleeping around, and I stayed home living this boring life. <laughs> Never got a party thrown in my honor. It was his way of saying, uh, it was another way of saying he didn't go out in the world like the younger boy did but he wanted to. That maybe these were his secret fantasies. Sleeping around. Getting drunk. No, 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 let me change that. You don't drink. No, you don't smoke. Dope. No, not you. You don't chase skirts. Nor pants. But are you judgmental of others? Do you have a tendency to see the sins of others but fail to see your own secret sins? And could it be that the reason the younger brother left home in the first place is because he couldn't stand being around his self-righteous, jealous, and judgmental older brother? How many people have been run away from the church because they ran into an elder brother who doesn't smoke, who doesn't drink, who doesn't chase skirts nor pants, but heart is full of jealousy, judgmentalism, and self-righteousness. But there's one last, and I'm in my seat, and it is this, and this is the worst of all, he was prideful. When we come to the end of the story, and Jesus leaves the story open-ended, and you have a younger boy who has gone out into the world, who has come back home, who's enjoying the party. And Jesus doesn't tell us that the older brother went inside and joined the party, or whether he stayed outside and sulking in anger and bitterness and self-righteousness. You see, I submit to you that the case could be made that his heart was full of pride. Too proud to go in the house. Too proud to let go of his jealousy and his self-righteousness. Too proud when the party was going on and the invitation had been extended, but he was too proud. No, you don't drink. No, you don't smoke. Dope. No, you don't chase skirts nor pants. But pride lurks around the corner for all of us. And we have to keep our guards up. Because at any moment, it can pounce upon us. But wait, as I back back from this parable, and as I hold this parable up in the light of God's holiness and word, and turn this story as if I'm holding a diamond seeing a different shaft of light. Wait a minute as I look at this parable through the lenses of whole Bible redemptive theology. I think I see another prodigal in this story. How do you know that? It's, there's a third prodigal in the story because I know it because the word prodigal not only means wasteful, but Lloyd Ogilvy was right when he said it means extravagant, lavish, unrestrained, and copious. Don't these adjectives more describe the father than they describe the boys? I see in this parable the prodigal father who loved his sons with an extravagant love, with a lavish love, with an unrestrained and copious and unconditional love. It is the prodigal father that's the reason that you and I are saved today is because of his unrestrained, uh, because of his copious and because of his lavish love. I don't know why he loved me, 
I don't know why he cared. I don't know why he would sacrifice his life, but oh, I'm glad. I'm glad that the prodigal father loved me and loved you copiously, unrestrainedly, lavishly, and unconditionally. Lord, we love you today and we thank you for your word and for taking such a familiar story and showing us a different side of your glory, your love, your compassion, and your forgiveness. Help us to guard our hearts against sins of the heart of self-righteousness and jealousy, pride, judgmentalism. Keep us, Lord, and make us the people you would have us to be. And when we run into those who may be struggling with open, obvious, and public sins, give us a heart of grace and mercy to help point them to your copious, extravagant, lavish, and unconditional love. Through Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. We're going to continue worshiping this morning, and we're going to declare the greatness of our God, that he reigns over everything, and he's so worthy of our praise. So let's stand and declare this this morning.
are dismissed.